Join me for a conversation with science fiction writer and neuroscientist Benjamin C. Kinney. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt, and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. All right, guys. Awesome interview coming right up. If you want to learn more about me and my resource books that help game masters, check out DiceGeeks.com. Here's today's interview. My guest today is a speculative fiction author, assistant editor of the science fiction magazine escape pod as well as a neuroscientist benjamin c kinney benjamin welcome to the show thank you so much for having me absolutely it's my pleasure um and i didn't mention it in the introduction but you have also played quite a bit of dungeon and dragons why don't you tell us about that oh yes i got into that at a early age i actually played the original um box sets the dungeons and dragons ones the ones that didn't say a D and D on them, but just Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but most of my experience, a lot of third and fourth, and a little bit of fifth edition. I haven't had much time in the last couple of years, but I definitely still consider myself a a, a player, and wish I had the time to be in a game now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what drew you to it originally? Oh gosh, yeah. I've always been sort of a fantasy and science fiction and other worlds and you know getting out of this one kind of thinker um mm. just the ability to 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 just imagine these these wonderful tales and be a part of them and create them and think about them is just a lot of fun for me yeah absolutely um absolutely but um uh, so that was really interesting. Um, I'm finding so many people who have become writers or who are writers have played Dungeons and Dragons. I think it's uh, the amount is actually staggering. That uh, and it, it makes perfect sense, of course, because oh, yes. that is a perfect training ground to learn how to tell stories. And the you, and it also appeals to the same kind of principles and ideas and people. Um, but yeah, it definitely has informed my desire and. And to some extent, the content writing of these stories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, yeah, I do have to ask, did you play mostly or did you run games? I mostly played. I ran one or two here and there, mm -hmm. um, but definitely more of a player. A lot of it is just sort of the, I'm a vi like when I get into something, I got to be very like obsessive and do all the things. So I just, I, I can't half-ass it and I don't mm -hmm. have the time to full-ass it. So I just don't do it. Okay. So I have uh, dreamed, I still have in my head, like I know exactly what campaign I would run if I had the time and the wherewithal to do it. Uh -huh. um, but yeah. So you're a big prepper then you would want to spend like 40 hours, like on a session or something. <laughs> oh, gosh, not that much, but, <laughs> but I would certainly spend a lot. I would want, I would want a lot of like, I, I plan a lot out and just have a lot of good ideas and structure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I used to prep a lot when I was younger, but uh, now that I have a family and other responsibilities, I've gone mostly no prep. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 At this point, I'm just working up to with fencing out my other responsibilities. Like, I don't even have enough time to play right now, so we're definitely not going to be running anything right now. Yeah. Um, but between right, family and work and being a writer and being an editor, like those things take up already far too many hours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so you said you were kind of always into this, you know, fantasy or or science fiction or escapes from, you know, escape from this world into other worlds. What um uh why do you think that is or what's the appeal to escape into another world? I see two different appeals. One of them is and I'm not sure which one what their causal relationship might be. One of them is just an attraction to the emotion of wonder. Like mm -hmm. I want to like see new things and just and 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 just get that feeling of like wow. And that is something that that nowadays with our world so well known and explored, like you know, through fiction is and speculative 
fiction, and by that I mean in the broad sense, including you know, books, TV, movies, games. All of these are are, are a big place where that that place is found, and it's also my day job as a scientist. It also is why I like to be a scientist. There's it's definitely a strong correlation between like science fiction fantasy fans and scientists. I don't gaming less so, um, mm-hmm. but that just maybe a sample size issue. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, and the, the other side of it, the flip side is of course being like, you know, having been that, that, that nerdy kid before, you know, before DD or anything like that was remotely cool and <laughs> being, having a very unpopular childhood and wanting things to retreat into, to get away from the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I I have always looked at it as kind of two different ways, like either an an escape to something or an escape from something. Um, and and it's role playing games are not one thing that that speculative genres allowed us to do is also like when we when we especially when we want to escape from things to also mm-hmm. be building a better world, building that world that we want to escape to, and. Dungeons and Dragons itself is not doing a lot of that, but um, you can see it a lot in fiction, even fiction that is inspired by Dungeons and Dragons and similar fantasies, where like, where where in that withdrawal, you're not only being somewhere else, but being someplace that you more want to live, a place that's more accepting of uh, and less 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 of a grind to to live in. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I know. Uh... Uh, Tolkien says a lot about that in his essay on fairy stories, and he views it more positively if we're trying to escape to something uh, than rather than from something. And so that, I find that interesting. I always found that uh, interesting because, you know, in many cases, though, we're escaping into, say, a Dungeon and Dragons world, certainly. And in many ways, it's worse than this world, right? <laughs> it's a uh, it's a, a more brutal world in some ways. Um, no, wh- why does nobody want to play a peasant? Come on. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Um, that you just have to, like, farm or something and try to, you know, rip some a little food out of the ground or something like that. No, we want to be warriors, right? Yeah. And part of that is because, like, you know, escaping to a role where we have power yeah. and and possibility and privilege and like you know we're not going to go play the farmer but we'll play a place where we can be you know this this a hero yeah. um and but also it is absolutely possible to make a fantasy even a dnd star world that's more accepting in other ways you get a lot of for example writers who were um you know, doing something like building a queer norm world where just like people were just like, it is not remarkable at all that people have whatever sexuality they have. And it's just like, sure, the world is a terrible grind because it's this medieval thing, but like, it can also be queer norm. Like, there's no reason why not. We're, we're building this world. We can choose it for, for, to make it, um, we can still choose to make it appealing in other ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, you touched on right there. I think, uh, um, when you mentioned that we can escape to some place where we have power, I think that's, that's interesting when we are, um, you know, we're seemingly always playing somebody who is very capable, whether in magic or in sword play or something like that. And, um, that certainly plays into a lot of our, our fiction and movies and all kinds of things. That uh, we want to to be the hero. Yeah, it's it's uh, that is a different podcast, but we can also, but that that I think that plays into a lot of um, a, a lot of things about life. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of sort of conspiracy thinking is about like finding the the solution, and and is in way a a fantasy of the powerless to find power. Uh, but that is beyond the scope of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, in the in the story, though, in a story or in fiction or in a role playing game, though, we do take on kind of that role of of somebody else. And um, I know, especially when I was a, a child, when I played Dungeons and Dragons, it was it kind of blew my mind to you know pretend I was an adult already, and um, yeah. I could just make 
decisions I wanted to and go places that I wanted to just because I had decided. And so that, uh, that felt really good when I was like 11 years old. Yeah. 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 And that's, um, in, you know, I, just uh i i don't know it just occurred to me a little bit but just out of uh curiosity when you were playing mostly uh what types of characters did you play oh it's i have a hilarious joke about this but or not or story about this because in in college um Mm -hmm. my my gm's like sister came Mm -hmm. and came and came to visit i became friends with the sister later as well but but apparently on on her first visit to campus she's walking around somewhere with my gm and she, she Points me out. He's like, "Oh, he's in my. Uh, he, he, uh, he plays in my game." And she says, "She just looks at me from across, from you know, fifty feet away, and says, he plays a wizard, doesn't he?'" <laughs> she was right. <laughs> nice. So mostly wizards. I mean, nowadays, as an adult, I'm consciously choosing to get myself variety and different yeah. play styles and things. But but my instinctual connection is absolutely wizards. Nice, nice. No, that's cool. It is the, the science, the, the scientist in me is like, no, like use use logic and brain power to get superpowers. Like, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, and probably also some tinkering and building things and alchemy and such. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering too, though, that you know. Uh, Sadly, you said you haven't been able to play in the last couple of years or whatever, but um, you have been uh, writing quite a bit. And um, I'm I'm always fascinated by this. And you've kind of, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, uh, and that we you know that the games kind of draw people who want to be writers, and, or writers are kind of drawn to the games. Um, uh, and I was just wondering, has playing Dungeons and Dragons affected your writing in some way? Yeah, I've done uh, absolutely. It has. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I mean, I've, I've done a. Rating is really the thing I spend my time on instead of gaming. Given you know, I'd love to do both, but time is finite, and mm-hmm. being good at writing is a thing that can you know it can be a full time job, and so it can take up all the time that that I want to put into it. Um, but uh, you know, I've gotten sold about. 20 short stories to professional um professional markets mag- professional quote unquote magazines though of course many of them are now online mm-hmm. um and some of them have been explicitly inspired by um by D and fantasy games if <laughs> i have one where where the character is like uh oh some heroes coming in town and by heroes i mean murderous vagabonds oh, gosh. <laughs> murder hobos yeah and like oh murder hobos are in town like we are in trouble um we better not let them think we're the villains <laughs> yeah um but uh, also a number of s- other stories and things i've written are kind of come out of ideas that developed in games that i played um whether D and D or otherwise, the novel that's sitting in the trunk that definitely um, the first kind of frame and ideas of it came out of a role playing game I played a couple of years D and D game that I played a couple of years ago and have one story out that's literally a rewritten backstory of a character. Um, so that use getting into these. Playing role playing games has definitely given me a lot of stuff to write about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. And um, but I'm I kind of also am thinking um, uh, a lot of people who play Dungeons and Dragons or other games kind of at some point in their life they will go, you know, they'll say to themselves, "This campaign will make a great story," and um, sometimes the translation though doesn't work out, does it? Yeah, it's a it's a classic kind of failure mode of fiction writing is writing something that comes straight from a from a from a RPG campaign mm-hmm. um, because the things that make a successful campaign are not the things that make a successful story. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the key ones being agency and choice in a sh- in in a in a playing game the. PCs have a limited amount of choice. 
I mean, they'll they'll have some, but 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 you know, events are are generally being driven by things the 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 GM is doing, and you know, there's the GM has to keep the players uh, in most situations as to keep the players on something like a track. Um, you know, obviously that's a gross generalization, but that's approximately true. Um, whereas I believe that in that fiction is about the choices of the characters, um, especially written fiction, written stories where, where the strength of the medium is your ability to get inside somebody's feelings and really get inside their mind and heart. And to do that, one of the things that I think a successful story needs is like characters making meaningful, difficult choices and grappling with those choices. Um, it, you know, having to choose sacrifices, make difficult emotional decisions and these are just not what role playing games are about and not where their focus is and uh and a story in a or certainly D style there are more you know um indie role playing games that, that they can focus in on that kind of thing um but i'm not super familiar with those just aware that they exist yeah um, and we yeah, that 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 sort of sense of the the characters' choices and emotions dr- needing to drive the story is a big one. That's the thing that that stories need that the role playing games don't generally have. There's also structural things, just kind of like tightness and focus, and having a theme and wanting every wanting the conflicts in the story to match the theme. You know, if you're players go off the rails and go do something that ends up being super fun. And it was a great like twist to the campaign can be super unsatisfying in a story because like they're, they're looking for a resolution to a story that you started with. And when you give them a different story or spend a bunch of time on a different story, like that's not interesting. Um, it's things like that, um, that, that make a direct translation difficult. Yeah. No, I think you 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 uh, you had a lot of good advice there. I th- I think maybe some listeners might have screamed when they heard you saying that that role playing game players were like on a track because that's usually uh, <laughs> railroading is usually considered a you know a a terrible sin uh, yes. for the dungeon master. But uh, but, but the, the opposite of railroad. Well, in many cases, the opposite of real railroading is about the player experience, not actually about the choice. Hmm. A not railroaded game is a game is a is a game where the player doesn't feel railroaded, not a game where the player is actually controlling everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've 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 heard people talk about that as well. Um, I usually try to really let my players go, and uh, really make sure I have real agency for my players. Um, you did say some things though there that are right because a certain session of Dungeons and Dragons may be very satisfying with your friends and all you did was go shopping. But in a f- story or a fiction, you know, s- short story or a novel, a shopping session is not going to be that much fun for the reader. Yeah. The, the, um, the, you know, D D is a social activity yeah. and that, and a lot of things that work great because it's a social activity are not things that will work great. Um, as as uh, um, the the work great in uh, in fiction in written fiction that also includes like the way inter character dynamics works like you can have a lot of fun with weird characters and interesting characters bouncing off each other in a in a um, in a in a game just as much as you can in a story but there's something very different about having multiple writers kind of balancing off each other versus and the unstructured way that that develops versus the structured thing that that you get in a in a story um, yeah. real real dialogue is dialogue is not real conversation mm. uh, and it is not supposed to be yeah yeah and um I think this probably it'll probably tie into some of what we've been talking about. Probably ties into the fact is why um, video game 
uh, video games don't usually make great movies uh, when they make a, a video game adaptation uh, into a movie and you there's something missing, right? Because the story was created by somebody else's choices. And now you're trying to make a structured story and it seems it, it doesn't seem as satisfying as, you know, um, uh, as the video game or it's, it's really weak because it didn't have one because the player was supposed to make those choices. Yeah. And, and I think, I think making the analogies like that is really useful because it becomes more, the challenge becomes more and more obvious as you extend it out. Like if you were given a painting and you had to write a story about that, like writing the story of the painting will not be a good story, but, if you take some of the images in the painting and the ideas of the painting and write your own story, a mm -hmm. new story mm -hmm. around those ideas, you could, that could be really successful. And the same thing goes for, 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 you know, doing translating from, from role playing games to a story. Like don't try to think of it as an act of inspiration rather than translation. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, um, I have seen many uh, guidelines to magazines that say, uh, do not submit a story that begins with a dwarf, an elf, and a uh, halfling standing at the, the entrance to a dungeon. Yeah, part of that is because part of, uh, <laughs> some of that is copyright issues. I love the way, like, <laughs> like why, aren't, why are there halflings instead of hobbits in uh, in yeah. in D &D? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were, the yes, um, they were sued. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, and um but in the short people are in the stories in fiction originality is going to be more is going to be more valued and like mm -hmm. yes you you want in a game where you need to have systems like having these and need to have multiple people collaborating and being able to fully understand each other around the table you need kind of a pre-designed structure in a story, you don't need that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can, and one of the failure modes is this like, oh gosh, it just looks like all the, oh boy, it's, it's, it feels like the same thing over again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, or it starts relying on the tropes and assumptions of role playing games that some readers will have and some readers will not unless you're 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 publishing at a very specialized place you don't want a story that only rpg players can enjoy yeah you know you want a story that more readers can enjoy that doesn't yeah. require this set particular background experience yeah so yeah no no absolutely well now you know i definitely want to get into your writing so um why don't you kind of give us an idea of what have you been writing recently and then um also i i you know i just mentioned a little bit you know a little bit that you're also a neuroscientist how does how does that play into your writing as well because i'm sure that leads you on to some really fascinating topics that you want to explore in fiction yeah um I, I write a mix of like very neurosciencey things and not neurosciencey at all things. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff I've been writing, been working on recently, has been more neurosciencey. It's kind of been a um, intentional like branding choice um, mm -hmm. to do more of that. Um, where I've been writing a lot of science fiction with um, brain cyborgs and artificial intelligences um, stuff, where uh, the um, where my understanding of the brain and mind is going to be really um give me a unique understanding and value that that can come across in my stories mm -hmm. and the right now i'm working on a uh, kind of a pair of novels one of them is out on on query looking for agents to be traditionally published that's about um a far future where where the solar system is divided between two great civilizations these androids who oh. emulate and fanboy and love the last couple surviving humans they're mm -hmm. they just think humankind is the coolest and they <laughs> just want it they just they just think we're very exciting they're very they're fans mm -hmm. um and they and they emulate our traditions they are androids because they want because you know this is their cultural choice Versus the AIs who have rejected all this and have just the ways and minds of their creators and don't value human style consciousness 
and are strange space robots living on the fringes of the solar system. Cold War between between those two civilizations, having characters who have partly human-like minds and partly not human-like minds, um, and what it means and how these different kinds of really alien to each other entities can get along and not get along, how they can understand each other if it's mm. possible. Yeah, and um, I'm right right now working on another a novel in this in this and a and a short story as well in the same universe told from um from a, a small society of human cyborgs who are who are who have tried to be part of this game not not as being kind of the fan these are not the the people the AIs are fans of those these are the people who have who have rejected that society and gone off to do their own thing and are kind of living the hard scrabble you know space grunge life of you know scavenging the stuff the ais leave behind and turning yourselves into cyborgs so that you can live and compete in the fringes of the solar system Mm -hmm. and uh them trying to get in on the action as the as of of the big of the big power politics that one's kind of a a spy thriller um Mm -hmm. where uh yeah i kind of think of it as um a spy who comes in from the cold meets ancillary justice. Yeah. Okay. No, that's really fascinating. Why do you th- why do you think you're kind of? I mean, besides the fact that it's just super cool, but why why do you think <laughs> you're uh, uh, kind of fascinated with uh, cyborgs and AI and that? So, I mean, part of it is I think it's super cool too. <laughs> yeah, that's the biggest part. But 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 it allows me to use some of my knowledge as a neuroscientist to, to have a where I have a unique understanding of like what. What are what are brains for? How do brains work? What is consciousness? What is consciousness for? What can what is it like to modify it through things like um, like cyborgs? I actually, did a little bit of um, brain machine interface work when I was in graduate school. Um, I have built cyborg monkeys. It is a fact. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Put put the little put the chips in their brains. Huh. Um, are they going they, to conquer us? That's always the question. No, <laughs> honestly, like the mo- if there were enough monkeys and you gave them like knives, like they don't need the freaking cyborgs. Like they're, they're <laughs> rhesus macaques are like vicious little hunters. Yes, uh, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> no, we 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 use this we use these implants to um, record their brain activity and understand how their brain controls movement. Um, because their their arm is very much like human arms, and so their their brain control of the arm is very much like ours. So we use this to, though this spinoff from my from the lab that I worked in is the was the the first company doing is currently doing clinical trials of brain machine interfaces, these cyborg implants for paralyzed humans. Like there are wow. there are genuine cyborg humans out there right now. There's a handful of people. The company's called BrainGate. Their clinical trials have people who are paralyzed with with implants in their brain that read out the person's um, movement intentions and uses that to control a computer or a robot. Wow, so that's that is real. That is not science fiction. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Wow. Um, yeah. So that's. So that's really interesting then um that you're kind of leaning into uh to some of that now and of course I mean um I mean it's just I, I just find all of that amazing that we're you know that uh I mean um uh, that we're progressing in such a way that could really help you know people who are paralyzed like that that's really awesome. Yeah there's this it's just kind of we're just barely beginning to understand the brain well enough to to mm-hmm. do this uh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've always thought even, you know, just going even back to, you know, some other, you know, popular science fiction, like, you know, uh, Star Trek, the next generation with data and different things like that. Just, um, it always seems like, like a cyborg or a complete Android or, or something is a very good, um, I don't know if you want to call it a device um, and more, I guess it's a pun, it could be a pun, but um, uh, that it's kind of a literary advice kind of to show us the, the um, kind of the mind or the consciousness that's outside of us. T- so we can 
really kind of think about what it means for us to be conscious. Does that make any sense? I always thought yeah, it was. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. it's, I'm, I'm, a, science fiction and speculative fiction are not about predicting the future. They're, they're yeah. about turning a lens on ourselves and seeing yeah. what we can. Though, like, as we get, it's interesting that's been true for decades, but as we get into the development of artificial intelligence now, it, it is nowhere near a modern AI is. <laughs> the things that Silicon Valley people call AI are nothing like the things that science fiction people think of when they you when know. they say the word AI. Um, yeah. But but you know maybe someday they will be given you know, and and now is the time to start thinking about what a relationship between humans and partially human, partially you know not even partially human but partially conscious, differently conscious, differently sentient, partially sentient. Like what happens when an AI has the brain capacity and flexibility of 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 a mouse what does does this deserve any like most people would probably say that animals have some moral rights not as many as a person some people will think as many as a person as a human person um most people would would probably say like they've got some like it's definitely like wrong to go kick a puppy um mm -hmm. but so so but what what rights does that AI have then? Um, yeah, the, that, that to, to bring this back together, my, my mm -hmm. I published a story that is both about that and is a role playing game story. Uh -oh. um, it is uh, it's from a Shadowrun game. Oh, nice! Uh, so kind of techno magic feature stuff. And I was playing online with some faraway friends. This was back before the before the pandemic. Back when playing, you know, over online was 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 an exciting innovation. So mm -hmm. I played a um, AI who was pretending he was a hacker. Um, <laughs> he told the team, I mean, I let the team like figure it out pretty fast. It wasn't about hiding it from them. It was just mm -hmm. my, my somebody who was like, yes, I only ever appear on screens. No, you will never meet me in person. Um, <laughs> and, and I wrote that character's backstory. And that, that story came out in analog science fiction and you can find online now. Oh, nice. um, yeah. But I just, yeah. yeah, I literally took that character's backstory, rewrote it, and like that, that story, that's one of my favorite ones I've written. Because it's about AIs that aren't really quite, that are definitely subhuman um, mm -hmm. in, in a literal sense that they are, they are less capable than humans. But it's a distributed artificial intelligence where it has each individual small subhuman part kind of comes together into higher level things that are that are closer to human or more able to fake humanity anyways and it um yeah yeah it, which is i think a, a really fun thing to explore because it's one of these sort of very different human these sort of conscious sentient thing that is very much not human mm. um and but but the ability to pretend to be human ends up being very important for it yeah yeah, no, that sounds awesome. Um, and I know why it would have gotten published because that sounds great. Yeah. Um, but I think it is interesting, though, that you say, like, you know, what we have now, what we call AI, and what usually we're talking about in science fiction is nothing alike. And, um, um, but I just find it, I don't know, I find it interesting, too, that it's just, um, I don't know, just how. I don't know how that line blurs sometimes in the popular media or something like that. We just, uh, we throw out terms and we just kind of, um, you know, uh, some people just kind of run with it and, and that, but I, um, I just always thought it was a really interesting mechanism to, to really kind of counterpoint off of humanity and see, you know, and kind of, um, use it to, to draw some either parallels or to point out some things that actually make us uniquely human. Yeah. It's, it's always a, I always find these uniquely human questions sort of fa really fascinating to play around with. Cause like unique, unique compared to what, or is it really unique or are there either sort of do all humans really have this or like would non-human things have this? Would it, what would it be like to be conscious without this? I mean, mm. a lot of, which, which is exactly the kind of fun thing to play around with in, uh, in fiction. 
mm-hmm. really get us thinking about what what is and isn't foundational to the human experience. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I find that fascinating. Um, really neat. I've I've played with uh, uh, AI and some different things like that in my novel that I published last year, and um, it's just fun to uh, it's just fun to play with and uh, and to to use in a story. I think it's just a, a really fun, um, yeah, just really fun concept. And um, also, I've begun. Uh, I also included uh, kind of uplifted animals as well, because what then changes if we, if, you know, if an octopus can hold a normal conversation with you, what have we, what, what is it then <laughs> kind of question? Is it, yeah. uh, you know, is it an animal still, or is it something, is it something else? And uh, I just, uh, those are some, just interesting concept that I've been playing with in my own yeah, writing. Sort of define animal is a surprisingly hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, define animal as distinct from human. Yeah, is uh, trying to find a clear boundary line between those two is pretty hard to do. Mm-hmm. It's not simple. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. But um, yeah, um, and it's uh. You know, I don't know. I, I I just I'm starting to think about things, and I'm not asking you any more questions. But um, uh, is there anything else in your work? Um, you know, you said you've been focusing a lot on AI and cyborgs, but um, are there any other stories or anything that we should uh, um, uh, be thinking? You know, that you're you're thinking about uh, as you're writing? Yeah, there's. I mean, there's lots of different, just sort of. Maybe maybe half of my stories have to do with neurosciencey topics. Um, mm-hmm. I really like I I enjoy writing fantasy. It's a lot more it's a lot more thematically liberating. Um, it can be it's a lot easier to give characters control and agency when you're not in a vast technological society. Um, it, it's more easy to literalize your the stories like meaning and metaphors and themes because that's what magic. Is that's to some extent what magic is um and it, what i talk different things that get me going can be all over the map um you know i've i've had a couple of stories one of which i mentioned in passing earlier sort of about the one where, where adventurers come through the town and everyone is a little uh freaked out yeah um, but it's actually about my desire to explore the idea of like prophecy in fantasy mm-hmm. Like, what does it mean when somebody can see the future? Like, how is that? Like, it's either this complete, usually it's either totally deterministic um, mm. and and it's kind of a curse. Um, think of um, what's his name in The Watchmen, Dr. Manhattan. Oh, yeah. Um, like, being Dr. Manhattan is a horrible curse. Like, seeing the fixed future and 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 seeing time as, as a fixed thing that cannot be changed is just terrible. Mm. Um, think about compared to like you know yoda in star star wars it's like well you know the important things are always clouded so this is actually useless <laughs> i can in theory see the future but never when you want to <laughs> only about the unimportant things yeah the future is always clouded and, and so i've tried i've had a couple different stories out just trying to play with these and make them more interest do find some interesting grist for it in the um in the story where the adventurers come to town, one of the characters is a prophet. The the, the premise of this story, it's called I Would. It's in Fantasy Magazine uh, last year. And the premise is the main character is a prophet who has been captured and imprisoned in a tower. And the adventurers come to town and she has to try to manipulate them into freeing her. Um, and But her prophecies are possible futures. Mm-hmm. And a lot of a substantial amount of the story is for like spinning out like, okay, if this happens, then this happens, that will happen. Oh, that's going to end badly. Okay, wait, let me try again. Maybe if I do this and then do that and then do the other thing, oh, that's going to end badly in a different way. Okay. How about if I do this thing um, where we're just really sort of playing with these possible futures and picking, trying to follow the ones that, that give her the most sort of hope for success. Mm-hmm. I have another one from a couple of years ago called uh, where is it? Sweeter Than Lead. Yeah, it came out in Podcastle in 2016, where the prophets, there is 
a terrible outside of time thing and the prophets try to kind of like sneak um some of its wisdom and sneak some of its visions but it's always trying to escape from its prison so you kind of need to take its visions with a grain of salt <laughs> and you can't tell anyone of their visions because then the visions are outside of its prison and then they're part of reality and then and and it's this being a prophet is a very dangerous game where like you can see you can see bad things and you can't really you can try to prevent them but you don't but, but you're not in control of what you see and and it's sort of a it's actually my attempt to write kind of a story with this Lovecrafty and Eldritch feel without all the kind of racial baggage that um that Lovecraft comes with. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Those yeah. are those are examples of concepts that I want to that I've played. Yeah. With. Yeah, that's interesting. I've I've seen it done in a number of ways in in uh in some stories or in some uh TV shows and different things like that and uh um usually you get something like a vision of the future, but it's out of context. So you don't know if the, you see the battle, but you don't know who wins or something like that, or, you know, um, and, uh, and the possible future thing has always been kind of really interesting to me actually right now in a campaign. um, I'm playing a, uh, a divination wizard. And so I have portent so I can reach in and pull out a possible future and give somebody, you know, uh, a failed role or something like that, depending on what I've rolled at the beginning of the session. Um, and so that, that's always a lot of fun. Um, so that, those, the, your stories sound really fascinating. Um, well, I definitely want to ask you, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about escape pod? Yeah. Uh, Escape Pod is the internet's original science fiction podcast. We've been going for like 12 years now. Um, many years before the invention of podcasts, as some people will count it. Um, but what we do is we publish the best sh- uh, short science fiction short stories with uh, we, with paid uh, readers. And we bring, bring that science fiction to your ears. Uh, and reading, we, we do about a 50-50 mix of, of new stories that have never been published before and finding stories that have been published elsewhere and kind of bring them to our audience, the podcast audience. Um, and at science fi- at Escape Pod, we only do science fiction, but we're part of a sort of family of podcasts called The Escape Artists. And there's um, Podcastle is our, our sibling who does fantasy and there's pseudopod for horror and cast of wonders for young adult fiction um and yeah we have free stories available online new ones every week and i many hundreds of issues back catalog uh we've been uh, magazine's been nominated for the hugo award a couple of times and other awards like the ignite award um we're a great it's a great science fiction magazine my job there as assistant editor is to manage the team of first readers. So uh, I could go, I could spend a long time on like, what is the short fiction? What are the operations of a short fiction magazine? Like Um, (laughs) to make a long story short, you know, we get a lot more submissions than we can publish. I have a team of about a dozen um, first readers who give the stories a a look, the first look I manage that team, develop that team, manage that team, train that team. I take the stories they like, look at those, and pass a handful of them up to the uh, the editors who will make the final editorial decisions. Okay. So, okay, that's I really see cool. A lot of fiction. I read yeah. a lot of short fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I was definitely going to ask about that. Um, um, and just, I know we have just a few minutes left here, but I, I, I definitely wanted to ask about that because, uh, well, I guess a couple of things, because I, I definitely know there are people in the audience who are thinking, I want to submit fiction because that's what I'm doing. I, I, I write science fiction or whatever, and I want to submit it. So, um, what, um, what are you looking for at escape pod? And then maybe since you read so much fiction, um, what are some things that you just, um, what are some things that you see a lot and maybe people want to avoid? Yeah. So at, at Escape Pod, um, we publish our stories both in text and audio, but we think about the audio first. Mm-hmm. Um, and that makes sets us apart from a lot of other short fiction magazines because we have to think first, like if this story isn't going to work in audio, we're just not going to publish it. 
uh, no matter how good it is. Um, mm. We and that affects things like pacing, um, because in audio it, it's really hard to skim ahead through the boring parts. It's really hard to go back and double check something if you get confused. Generally, mm. if people get confused reading or listening to a podcast, like they're just out. They're not going to go back and, and and reread in a way that would be pretty easy to do in the text. Mm. Um, so we have higher demands for sort of consistent pacing and clarity than other markets. We also like we kind of have like to have a, a, a positive, um, fun tone. Uh, you know, we don't you listen in on the way to work. We don't want to leave you like with tear stains on your cheeks walking into work. Um, <laughs> That's 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 the original justification. Like we don't want you sobbing in the parking lot on the way to work. That's rude. Um, so 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 we don't publish a lot of really downer, uh, dark and depressing stories. Uh, those stories are great. I still to this day recall my favorite one of the favorite stories I ever wrote in the slush read in the submissions pile. I remember reading the note being like, I cried three times reading this story. It's amazing. It's going to win awards. And then like the editors are like, we don't publish. Stories where you cry three times, I'm like I know, but it's so good. That story did get published in Apex Magazine, so so it's it's good that it went on and in, in oh, well, that's but, good and yeah. succeeded. But uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's just not what we do. Yeah. Um, in terms of advice, I would find there's a there's a couple of things that have really struck me as the things that separate a the, the stories that just aren't ready for prime time. That you know just don't have the the feel and the flow and the prose of a of a professionally published story, mm-hmm. but there's stories that are competent and functional, but but not working. And mm-hmm. for me, the most common thing, the most common failure point for otherwise competent story, is not having a clear sense of direction from the opening page. Um, by direction, I mean goals, motivation, stakes, some combination of those things. Goals like what does a character want? Motivation, what is really like driving this character's psychology? Why do they want the things they want? Stakes, like what's at risk? What 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 will they lose if things go badly? Um, and without some of those, you don't know what's progress and what's not. You don't know what's what's forward motion and what's a setback if you don't know what you're moving toward. Uh, and so lack of those on the opening page is, I think, the, the biggest thing that I find that, that will trip up a story that's otherwise well put together. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I know, like I said, a lot of people out uh, who are listening uh, are, are definitely uh, writers and they're probably submitting to places. So that's... Uh, um, I think that's definitely helpful because, um, I think sometimes, you know, we, you know, we'll, we'll write something and we're, we're thinking, you know, well, this is the best thing I've ever written, but if we kind of lack some of that direction or goals or stakes, uh, it's still, uh, it, it can still hurt the story quite a bit. Yeah, it, 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 I, I, I'm of the opinion that whether or not you think your story is the best things ever written, and that's a you for any any. This is true for any writer. Yeah. Um, that's a statement about your psychology, not about the story. Like there's oh, some people yeah. who always think their stories are the best ever. I'm I'm yeah. in that group. There's oh, some I, people who always yeah. think their stories are trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter how good or bad they are. Yeah. Like I'll read my draft and be like, "This is awesome," and then I'll like give them to somebody else to read, and they'll be like, "I didn't understand any of this." Like, yeah. Oh, but I thought it was awesome. That's because I'm optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's the, and and confident like that's that's really all that that's what it means. It's not actually much of a statement about the story. Yeah, There's well, so I, much. Yeah. Uh, another piece of advice is that like yeah. outside readers are absolutely critical. A story, whether it's a short story or even more so a novel, like it's a TARDIS. It's bigger on the inside. You cannot see all of it from the inside. Somebody mm-hmm. who's seeing it from the outside and doesn't have all the stuff that you've also built in your head can get a clearer view of it than than you can yeah um having outside readers is 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 so important for most people's process but everyone's process is going to be different yeah yeah and of course i meant like i I was meaning um it's the best thing that like i've ever written not necessarily the best thing ever written or something like that um and uh uh yeah and, uh, you know, but I, I, I totally get your point because I tend to think 
I tend to think everything I write is terrible and then I have to have people tell me that it's, it's actually okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's really awesome. Well, you know, we're, we're coming down here on time. Uh, Ben, why don't you just, uh, Remind us, where can we find Escape Pod? Where can uh, listeners find your stories or, or learn more about you so they can uh, read about some awesome uh, AI cyborgs and some really cool other stuff? Yeah, so um, Escape Pod, you can find it at escapepod.org or at ver- whatever your podcast catcher app of choice may be. It's going to be there. Um, my website is Benjamin C. Kinney dot com benjamin c kinney all is one word and there i have a publications page that lists all my short stories most of them are available for free online in some form or another uh, and you can have links to all of them there uh, so that is a great place to do that and oh here's it and actually mm-hmm. you know, Social media, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Ben C. Kinney. Um, but another, <laughs> hopefully some readers have gotten this before, um, but if you're writing short fiction, mm-hmm. the website that you need is something called the Submission Grinder. Mm. Um, the URL is thegrinder.diabolicalplots.com because it's run from a magazine called Diabolical Plots. But it's a short story market like search and tracking thing you can be like find me every market that will pay eight cents a word for science fiction of three thousand words of length that i haven't yet submitted this story to and like bloop it'll tell you huh. um, and track them that is it is if you were getting into submitting short fiction that website is the tool for finding where to submit it um you know you're not familiar with markets like that'll take time to build like now just search for like who pays well okay those are those are popular places. Those those are places worth looking into. Um, huh. okay. Not universally, but that's, yeah, it, there it is a the, that website is the best tool for somebody starting a, to submit uh, short uh, short fiction. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that'll be helpful to a lot of people. So thank you for mentioning that. And of course, I will uh, put links uh, in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. I will put the link to your website and to Escape Pod, and maybe I'll put it, uh, I'll find the one for uh, Story Grinder, and I'll put that in there as well. So anybody who is listening to this right now can head over to dicegeeks.com and find those links uh, very easily. Well, Ben, this was a, a fascinating conversation. I could probably keep on asking you a a ton of questions but um i will respect you time uh thank you so much for coming on the podcast today wow this has been so much fun i wish i had the time to do it's always the sign of a good one of these conversations we're like oh i could go for another hour yeah but time moves on and (laughs) it's been a pleasure being here All right, there you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Benjamin today. Really fascinating to talk about science fiction writing, uh, also the neuroscientist and some of the, uh, uh, I mean, monkeys with uh, microchips. I mean, it's crazy stuff. Amazing stuff. So that was really awesome. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. If you want to learn more about Ben and his work and the magazine Escape Pod, please head over to DiceGeeks.com. Check out the show notes for this episode. You will find links there. You can check those out. Awesome stuff. All right. Now, if you want something for free, you're going to head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free, and you're going to get some free stuff, seriously, for role-playing games. Also, if you want to help out the show in some way, you can always like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you're listening in your favorite podcast player or app or whatever those things are called. And if you want to help the show out financially, which would be amazing, you can do so at patreon.com slash dice geeks. All right. Now, guys, I really thank you so much for listening. And until next Wednesday, keep gaming.